Okay. Okay. I think we are live. Okay. Let's get started. Continue our discussion on expansion. And so last time we had talked about, we had introduced last, the last two lectures, we had introduced expand, sort of we had motivated why we want these expander graphs. We had defined expander graphs combinatorially. We had defined it in terms of vertex expansion. That is, we wanted all sets of which are not too large to expand by a factor A. That is the neighborhood of every small size set should be uh, large enough. This was a vertex expansion. This is what we call vertex expansion. And we saw that it has such graphs do exist. In fact, they're abundant. Most graphs, the regular graphs are vertex expanders. Then we also saw that these graphs are very useful. For example, they helped in reducing error in uh, RP algorithms, randomized, one-sided error, randomized polynomial time algorithms. You could reduce them to any delta as long as the delta is inverse polynomial without paying an extra random bit. It sort of did this. It is they run the RP algorithm in the following sense. Instead of just picking a random, uh, imagine a super explicit uh, vertex expander on the set of random coins, on the set of random coins, and pick a random coin, pick a random coin at random, pick a pick a coin at pick a set of coins at random, pick a random string, pick a random string at pick a uniformly random string, and then instead of just running the algorithm on the on that particular string, run on all strings in the T neighborhood around this. And this let us, and this showed that this invariably, this ball will escape any small size set. That's why it's called the hitting set. It will always escape. It will, with a very, not always, with very high probability, it will escape. The probability that it will lie fully in a set of size at most half will be 1 over 8 to the T. Shown this, a robot expansion. But what we wanted to now spend is can we construct such graphs and vertex expansion the definition is a nice definition we had an application of it but it's not a very analytic quantity to work with it sort of states the very de description of the uh, property states for every set of size at most k now how do you check this you have to go over all sets of size k this is a very it's uh, and the number of sets of size k is exponentially large. It's not an easy property to check. So what we want is another property of the graph which is easy to check, uh, such that if you if the graph satisfies that property, it implies uh, vertex expansion. So we want sort of an analytic property of the graph which will certify vertex expansion is true. And what we will see today, the focus of today's lecture will be fully to see that. The spectrum of the graph, in particular, what is called the second eigen, the absolute second eigenvalue of the graph, is such an analytic property. If the second eigenvalue of the graph is small, absolute second eigenvalue of the graph is small, then the graph will be a vertex expander. This will be, it will take us the whole lecture to do this, but this will be the theme of the lecture. This will be an analytic quantity that captures vertex expansion. So, and this will be, this is how we are going to define uh, spectral expansion. So, for that, let's. So today is going to be expansion in terms of spectrum of what we, what we call the normalized adjacency matrix. So before I even come to the definition of more spectral expression, we'll spend a quick primer on what uh, things we need from linear algebra because I'm not going to, but for one theorem called the spectral theorem, I, I won't assume anything from linear algebra. I'll state whatever, whatever we state, I'll either I'll state it explicitly or we'll prove it along the way. So I'll have a short primer on linear algebra and then we'll get on to the spectral definition. So we're given a graph G as, it, as always on N vertices and it's typically deregular. So all the expanders graphs that we'll talk about will be deregular graphs. They'll have a constant degree of D, but what I'm going to say today will not, it will be more general than that. We, the proofs all for all the proofs, we'll assume it's deregular and do it, but every single statement 
it actually will be true even for the non regular case and and somehow i find it actually convenient to work on the non regular case and that's a will be the what's called the adjacency matrix of the graph what is a so a is some matrix from r of v cross b so that a u v is one if u v is an edge and zero otherwise notice that a is a symmetric matrix okay what we'll actually be working with is not the adjacency matrix but we'll work with a related matrix which is the normalized adjacency matrix so we'll work with what is m which is the normalized sometimes called the normalized adjacency matrix actually i like to call think of it as the uh, there it's also referred to as a random walk matrix which i think is a more is a nicer name for it and we'll see in a few minutes why why it is actually called the random walk matrix So what is this matrix? It's just I'm going to normalize. So m of u of p is just going to be a of u of v by the degree of u. So in some sense, so in the in our case, we are just normalizing every entry by one over t. We're normalizing every entry by one over t. Maybe t if if it's a deregular graph, it's just reducing it. and it is fun so another way of viewing this m is or equivalently m is d inverse of a where d is the diagonal matrix whose diagonal entries are the degrees this is exactly okay so that's the matrix we are going to be working with for this when we talk about spectral expansion now whenever you have a matrix it represents two objects what the two objects uh, it can there can be two represent what does a matrix represent? of course it's an entry of n square n square elements but it can represent two objects and one it can be viewed as a linear operator the other it can be viewed as a quadratic form it represents either a linear operator or a quadratic form and both these representations both these view points of the matrix will actually give us some meaning so let's look at either of them let's look at the operator the linear operator view point plus so linear operator is we can view given a matrix of this form it's it defines a map it defines a linear map from rv to rv in particular take any f in rv you can it will map it to mf more plus hmm more precisely what's happening mf so f is some so f is some function f is some function in rv f is some vector in rv by the way so one thing that you will do in towards this course is all vectors will be column vectors so the column vectors so what is mf mf is also another vector let's say what is mf of v this is by definition you go over all v m u v f v that's the matrix multiplication matrix vector multiplication this one now let's look at what is this operator doing in at least in our specific case m u v v so let's go let's let's stare at this matrix m this one this matrix notice the way we had defined it this is a row stochastic matrix what do i mean every row sums to 1 it don't sums to 1 and it's also 
non negative all the entries are zero or greater hmm? so notice this operation this operation is actually what is it doing mfv mfv is just an average of all the neighbors of uh, it takes f at all the neighbors if you look at what this operation is doing let's look at for this specific case when m is a row stochastic matrix this is sort of an averaging mf of v is the average value of f over all its neighbors because muv is sort of an a row stochastic m is a row stochastic matrix it's an average happening uh, pralad on the left hand side it is mf of u right did i make a mistake yes i made a mistake this is true for all u so it's sort of an averaging operator and from this it must be clear that if you take the all ones operator if you take the all ones function that's actually m1 of that is 1 because it's average the, the all ones function when you take the average it remains 1 and if you done a bit of linear algebra you will realize that this is this so then hence one is what is called an eigen vector and the corresponding eigen value is one we'll come to that a little later but this is useful to know that is one is an eigen vector with corresponding eigen value being one hmm? so by the way we only talk so this is one way of doing it but and this is this is not the only linear operator we can associate with them this is when you view m as when you do left multiplication by n now uh, this is left or right i have a left right issue this is left multiplication by the m is being multiplied on so you can also think of what a similar thing which you can do by right multiplication that is you take a vector let p be a vector in r v and map p transpose to p transpose m or equivalently p to m transpose m. that's right multiplication by the matrix or left multiplication by the transpose of the matrix and let's see what is this object doing what is m transpose p of u this is by the same definition it's m transpose u v p of uh, v let's go back to this one this is v this is m v u p v so it will be convenient to write this as p p v m v u now let's stare at this equation let's stare at this equation a little bit this last equation this is a nice equation okay left uh, i want to say that this is a slightly different operation from left multiplication left multiplication was an averaging operation what is right this is a this is a row it's a symmetric matrix m therefore in our case they are both the same but i want to actually give it that has a meaning this has a meaning these are two different meanings and i want to keep these meanings separate in the case of symmetric matrices these two meanings happen to be the same but it's actually worthwhile to keep these two meanings as different meanings now let's look at what's happening over here let's look at what's happening so suppose so let's think of p as a probability distribution on the vertices so p is a probability distribution on vertices you start with a probability distribution then you take a step according to this row stochastic matrix mtp is the neck is the subsequent distribution therefore mt this is actually this is representing in some sense the random walk specified by the matrix specified by matrix and what is the random walks at any neighbor at if you are at a particular vertex you should go to a neighboring vertex with probability proportional to 
pick an edge going out of it equally at random and go to one of these. This is the random walk. It's fine. So the random, if you are in a particular, so if you are in a particular vertex, you go to a neighbor with probability proportional to one over the degree of the current. This one in a symmetric graph, this is exactly one over t everywhere. But in a, in a, sorry, in a regular graph, in a regular graph, this is the case. But this need not be the case. But always MTP represents this sort of random walk. So left, right multiplication. So so left multiplication is this averaging operator, whereas the right multiplication is thought of representing the random walk. Represents a random walk. So in, in some sense, suppose you start with the distribution P. Hmm? You take one step in this, you go to M MP. Sorry, sorry, P transpose this one. You take two steps in this graph, you go to one and so on. You take R steps and sort of this represents the random walk, uh, R step random walk, and we will analyze this random walk very carefully, either both in this lecture and next lecture. So you're given a you're given a matrix. You look at the corresponding normalized adjacency matrix. It represents a random walk. And what is the random walk? The random walk is actually the operation given by right uh, the right multiplication by the matrix. That's clear. And if you look at it this way, there are some probability distributions for which the the question we can ask is: Is there a stationary distribution? And what do I mean by a stationary distribution? Is there a distribution such that pi is equal to, sorry, pi transpose is equal to pi transpose m. That is when you take a step in the walk, you remain unchanged. Hmm? Now, suppose the graph was deregular. What is the candidate stationary distribution? Is there a stationary distribution? Yeah, there's a uniform distribution. Yeah, and is it clear that the uniform distribution satisfies this? Everybody, by that. So I want to. What Abhishek is stating the following is: if if G is deregular, then the uniform distribution. That is pi pi u is equal to one over n for all u and v is a stationary distribution. And this should not be hard to see. This just follows from if you stare at this uh, green equation, this is what exactly random walk is doing for us. Hmm. Hmm. And you, in fact, more generally, sort of, it's, I'm, I'm going to, you can check this out for yourself. If you define pi u to be equal to the degree of u, was by the sum of the degrees of the vertices. So this is a probability distribution, W and B. This is actually, in more, in more generally, this is, this, this is a stationary distribution for M. This will satisfy that pi transpose M is equal to pi. That is, check this out. So what we would like to see is what are, so we saw that when you view it as a, a left, so there's left multiplication and the right multiplication going on. These are the same with respect to sim, if the graph is deregular, but it need not be the same. And there's a reason, I would like to keep these two as two different objects. The graph is regular. These happen to be the exact same object. One, we like to keep it, Way. And we saw that right multiplication, left multiplication corresponds sort of averaging 
uh, it's an averaging operator. Left multiplication is sort of represents a random walk matrix, random walk on the graph. And if you do it, if you view, and in both cases, we saw an eigenvalue and an eigenvector. And left multiplication, the all ones function is an eigenvector. In the that's for left multiplication. For the right multiplication, the, the stationary distribution gives the, the stationary. The, notice the all ones function is always a left eigenvector. For the right multiplication, if the graph is deregular, then the uniform distribution is a stationary distribution. In other words, it's a right eigenvector. Uh, and but more generally, this distribution is always the right eigenvector when you view, when the graph is not regular, not necessarily regular. Okay. Any questions so far? This is the linear operator viewpoint of a matrix. We will soon go on to a quadratic uh, form operator viewpoint of a matrix, and then we'll use both of these to eventually talk about the spectrum of the underlying of the matrix. Any questions so far? Okay. In hoping this is all basic stuff and people follow. What, what I want to understand are the eigenvalues of this matrix. So more precisely, I want to understand these objects. So eigenvalues and so let's quickly write down what I want. So if M is a M is a R V cross R V matrix and phi is some Rb and lambda is some value. We'll say that such that m phi is equal to lambda phi. Then we say phi is an eigenvector. With eigenvalue. Lambda. What we have seen is the matrix, the matrices which we have uh, when a matrix arises from a random walk on a given graph, it does have an eigenvector. That's what we have seen. What we will I'll shortly, we'll shortly see is actually it not only has an eigenvector, it has a full eigenspectrum. But for that, let's wait. Let's. I'm going to go to the other viewpoint. I'm going to the viewpoint of a quadratic form of the matrix. Uh, this treatment is slightly different from what's uh, the treatment given by Salil in his book. I sort of prefer this treatment. So let's go ahead with this. Uh, it'll take me a little longer, but somehow I prefer doing it this quadratic form. So for, for this, first we'll define, define an inner product on the space. Inner product is just some function from Rv cross Rv to R, which is bilinear and has the property that Ff is zero if and only if F itself is the all zero function. Hmm. Yes. So, so what the way is inner products? One is a standard dot product, which you have seen is an inner product. What I'm going to do is actually work with a slightly different inner product for when I, we talk about eigenvalues. So it will be the inner product, the following inner product. I'm going to define, so give me, so let f and g be two functions, in, two vectors in Rb. The inner product of g, this inner product will be based on u. I'm going to use the stationary distribution. It's going to be the following inner product, summation pi u. F u g. It's almost the same dot product which we do, except that we have scaled. In the case of the deregular case, we just scaled it down by one over d the entire time. So this is, in some sense, it's the expected value of f u g u when I pick u at random from v, but according to the distribution. I think in the definition of inner product, you need also need to insist that f dot f is non-negative always. I think, yeah, I think need to do it because I'm doing it on this. I'll have to define. Yeah, because I'm doing it on the reals, I'll have to do this. That's Even in it. complex, I think uh, you have to say that. I have to say that okay. yeah, because I want it to be a norm, so I want f dot f. 
is non-negative always. Rather, rather, let me state it this way. That is f dot f is non-negative and is equal to zero if, if f is zero. It's always non-negative and it's equal to zero if f is zero. Yeah, and even in the definition of eigenvalue, I think one needs to say that uh, you know there is a non-zero vector whose scale is that guy. That Otherwise, zero right. always becomes an eigenvalue. That's my definition of the inner product. Hmm. Now. We'll associate a quadratic form yeah so we're going to go a little bit of pain by doing this quadratic form and all over here because i think the proofs later on become much cleaner if you work with this product this is a, a slightly different treatment from what we, uh, salil does in his notes he works with the usual dot product and usual matrix but and the as there's this one sort of i prefer this because Later on, the proofs become cleaner. There are no one over n or one over square root n terms that float around. So it's an initial pain, but once we accept this notation, it'll take us about half an hour to get uh, accustomed to this notation. The rest of the proofs are going to be fairly cleaner later on. So this is sort of what we, uh, where I'm going to deviate. Otherwise, the proofs, what I do and what Salil has in his notes are, are identical. But for this fact that we are going to work with this inner product rather than the usual inner product. The quadratic form associated with m is what I want to. Today. We're going to look at the quadratic form FMG. So I'll forget to put pi, but in the inner product, I will subscript it by pi. But I, whenever we talk about an underlying random walk or a graph, the inner product will always be this inner product. It won't be that usual dot product. So let's see what this quadratic form looks like. By definition, this quadratic form is expected value of u of f u m g u. But what is this? This is further. F u. This we saw, what was it? This is exactly. Uh, set of all v in v m u v g v mm -hmm. so what is this this is expected value of u pi in v summation v in v m u v f u GV. Now, let's look at what is the subject. What is MUV? MUV is, con is was what is it? It's in the random walk. It is given that you are in U, what is the probability that you go to V? This was what MUV represented. Hmm? What MUV represents? Hmm? Hmm? So, Stare at this carefully. This is exactly the it's for our this one. This is exactly pick a edge u v at random, completely from random from the uniform distribution of f u comma g v. Let's stare at this distribution. What is at least let's do it for the regular graph case, and then I want to say the same argument. You can come. Let's let's just convince ourselves that this is true for the regular case. What is this? This is first saying pick a vertex uniformly at random, and then go to your uniform neighbor. Hmm? So pick a vertex uniformly at random and then go to a uniform neighbor. This is exactly the distribution you will get by picking an edge completely at random. And that's exactly what's happened. Over here. So these two distributions, this followed by this is exactly this distribution. So what I claim is this, first you pick a U at random from V, then you follow by picking a V according to the random walk. This is exactly the distribution of picking an edge at random. This is it's obvious, it's evident from 
the if the graph is deregular but just you write it down and check that even if the graph is not deregular this actually it's exactly the same if this the, the reason for doing bringing this pi inner product was not the pi inner product to work with uh, to work with the normalized adjacency matrix was precisely to make this operation nice out. okay so this quadratic form this quadratic form which i want to work has it has a very nice representation this way and actually what does this tell you this tells you that this is also equal to g because this is symmetric in m m and f this is also equal to gmf and because we are here the, the inner product is symmetric for us this is mfg so in other words these inner products so m is if so m is this is these are what are called m is self adjoint with respect to this inner product And self-adjoint definition is just this: F M G pi is equal to M F G. And such matrices have uh, such matrices have a very such matrices. The spectral theorem guarantees that if a matrix is self-adjoint with respect to an inner product, it has a full eigenspace basis and not only does it have an eigen basis it has an eigen basis which are orthonormal with respect to this inner product and that's what we will use this one that's let's state that right now i want to state the spectral theorem let's go to the next page okay. so let and and this be an inner product such that m is self adjoint so this theorem will take without proof self adjoint with respect to this inner product then there exists v1 v2 v n n so let's write this in terms more generally cross n and corresponding lambda 1 lambda 2 lambda n in r such that the following are true one for all i m v i is equal to lambda v i lambda i v i that is v i is an eigen vector with eigen value lambda i and furthermore the v i is v j s are orthonormal that is they are they are unit vectors and they are orthogonal mutually of a, a pairwise orthogonal for each other the spectral theorem guarantees to you this very nice property and from what we have our matrix m was self adjoint with respect to this inner product so in particular it has not just one eigen vector as we observed it has n eigen vectors which are orthogonal uh, which are pairwise orthogonal and have corresponding eigen values lambda 1 to lambda So this is something which we'll use off the shelf, the spectral theorem. Hence, M, our matrix M, that is the random walk matrix, has a full eigen decomposition.
an orthonormal eigenvalue. It has an eiffel basis. And it's not hard to see that um, all the eigenvalues. So I would like to know what are these eigenvectors and eigenvalues for it. We certainly saw one, the all ones function is an eigenvector with corresponding eigenvalue one. Hmm? Now, M was an averaging operator. The left multiplication by M was an averaging operator. Therefore, there cannot be any eigenvector larger than whose absolute value is larger than one. So it's easy to see. It's an, it's an easy remark. So a couple of things that you see is we already saw that M1 is one. That is M1 is an eigenvector. With eigenvalue one, the all ones is an eigenvector with eigenvalue. That's this remark we already saw. The other remark is because M is an averaging operator. Hmm. If lambda is an eigenvector, if it's not hard to see that if m of uh, b is equal to lambda v for some lambda in r and v in rn rv then mod lambda is necessarily less than or equal to 1 it's an averaging it cannot none of these values go. so one is the largest eigen value all of this is stating therefore in particular for this particular if m is the random walk matrix what we have is the following. We have that the largest eigenvalue is one, and then the eigenvalues are going smaller all the way up to lambda n, which is greater than minus one. And the corresponding eigenvectors are the all ones, and let's call it V2 all the way up to Vn. Those are the eigenvalues, and these are the eigenvectors. And furthermore, all the Vi's are pairwise orthogonal and also we, they are orthogonal to the all ones. Okay. This is something which we will have. In. Okay, so the spectral theorem guarantees to us this effect. Now, what do we want to say? Well, I haven't yet, uh, all of this was to define spectral expansion. So let's look at the eigen spectrum, the eigen spectrum of the random walk. So we saw what we've seen is it lies between minus one and one. So this is where lambda one is, and the others, there's lambda two somewhere here, lambda three, and all the way up to lambda n. Okay. Now we're going to define what's called the spectral gap of a random walk. The spectral gap is this, the maximum of this distance. So we, so spectral gap of M is how far, is there another eigenvalue which also has absolute value one? If not, how far, if then the spectral gap is zero. If not, the gap between that other eigenvalue and one is what we'll refer to as spectral gap. The spectral gap is the minimum of one minus lambda two, and what's the other one? It is lambda n minus one. It's this. That's what we'll refer to as spectral gap. So, is the notion that's of spectral like gap lambda n plus one, right? Uh, Sorry, lambda n plus one. Yeah. This, let me make it very this one. So what I mean is, how should I write it? It is one minus absolute value of lambda. I don't want to write it that way. Yeah. This could, yeah. Okay. So this is what I, this is what we'll call a spectral gap. And the larger the spectral gap, we call a graph. This will be the analytic property that we care about. We'll show shortly, by the end of today's lecture, we'll show that this property 
captures expansion. So that's going to give us a expander definition, spectral expansion. So a graph G V E on N vertices. is said to be a gamma spectral expander if the spectral gap of the associated random walk matrix is at least common. So the larger the spectral gap, we'll say the graph has better expansion and better spectral expansion. So this will be the definition of, in terms of, so if I can show you that, if I give you a graph and I construct this lambda two and lambda n, and I show that they are far away from one and minus one respectively, this is proof of the fact that this is what we'll call spectral expansion. And by the end of today's lecture, we will see that why spectral expansion implies vertex expansion. That is, if you can prove to me that lambda two and lambda n are away from their respective endpoints, then actually, the graph has good spectral expansion, has good vertex expansion. And we'll state the converse that is, in fact, if a graph is, has vertex expansion, then it also has good spectral expansion. But that we will not prove. And we won't need that direction for this course, but that's also a true thing. So let's stare at this definition. Do you follow this definition? Questions since you can utter silence. What's this definition of uh, the this uh, I mean lambda n can be positive, right? Lambda n can be positive, in which case that number happens to be a positive number larger than one. Anyway, I'm taking minimum, so it will then it will not be it it won't affect the minimum at all. I see. So it's a smaller gap. If lambda n is positive, this gap, this side gap becomes very large. So it won't affect, it won't change the minimum. The minimum as well then come from lambda 2. 1 and 1 is the gap between 1 and lambda 2. Yeah, makes sense. Okay. In an equivalent way to think of it is this, there's this notion of spectral radius, which is what is the ball around the origin you can draw that contains all the eigenvalues. And the spectral gap is the difference between 1 and the spectral. No, what's the, once again, spectral radius is what? Uh, look at the ball around the origin uh -huh. that contains all the eigenvalues. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. I'll ignore one. But, but yeah, ignore the trivial eigenvalue, which is the one eigenvalue. That is yeah. this, or rather, the, ignore the eigenvalue corresponding to the eigenvector, which is uniform. Yeah. Like if so, there are other eigenvectors which also have eigenvalue one, then the spectral gap is zero. Because there are non trivial eigenvalues that seem to be sitting there. Yeah, this is why I don't like lambda g, the notation which Salil uses, because that is for the spectral radius, which is one. Uh, somehow people use that. So I let's only talk about spectral gap, not about spectral radius. Spectral radius for random walk matrices is always one, unless you're working with the space orthogonal to the uniform distribution, uni to the all ones function. So let's talk about spectral gap uh, fully, because notationally it's a pain, it's a pain. They call it lambda g. Lambda g of a may walk is used is the spectral radius, which for this particular walk is one. It's not one. Anyway, uh, I'm confusing people. So it, it easily you can see that because of this, it follows from the spectral theorem. So by the way, the norm of a the norm of a vector f the two norm of a vector is just this object. So 
to to be sometimes more to make it more explicit i will actually write this so index this with pi just to show that this two norm is being taken taken with respect to this pi inner product it's not for the arbitrary inner product want what to say is this an equivalent uh, gap notion of spectral gap is the following the spectral gap equivalently equivalently if equivalently we want to say for, for the spectral gap spectral gap gamma of matrix m is exactly the min over all f which are orthogonal to the all ones of Right now, I will write it this way. It's one minus it's one minus max over all f components of m f. And this should be easy to see. That's the spectral gap. Let's see. Take any f which is orthogonal to it. Find out what's the largest value it's been. Uh, 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 a, 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 take a take f which is orthogonal to the all ones expand it and find out what it's, it's a, what's this largest ratio this ratio is one if f were the all ones vector now look at any other vector which is orthogonal to all ones find out what's the largest value and that subtracted from one is the spectral gap you can uh, check this out this is follows from the this is a consequence of it's a consequence of the spectral theorem easy to see so is this okay so far so what we will now do the all of this was to define the notion of spectral expansion in terms of this gap it's in terms of the gap of the of the next largest eigenvalue after you take off the trivial eigenvalue what's Mm, this one. How far is this value? This one. Uh, how how close is lambda two to one, or how close lambda n is to minus one? And I want to say that this closeness or this farness is what determines the expansion of the graph. So next, what we will next see is how does spectral expansion relate to vertex expansion? Okay, and prior to doing that, we'll actually define. We'll do what's called the expander mixing lemma. We'll prove the expander mixing lemma because that will come useful in proving this direction. So we we'll prove what's quite a popular. This is actually a very powerful tool. What's the state? Expander mixing lemma. It says the following: Let M be a random walk matrix. With spectral gap one minus lambda, and S and T random walk be two subsets of the vertices so that mod S is alpha fraction of the vertices, mod T is beta fraction of the vertices. Then let's look at this quantity. Let's look at suppose I pick a random edge. UV uniform and look at what's the probability that the left end point is in S and the right end point is in T. I pick a random edge in this graph, uniformly at random, and I ask what's the point probability. So let's look, let's look at this experiment. You have graph here. There's some set S and there's some other set T. By the way, S and T need not be disjoint sets. They could overlap. They could be the same set. Anything. Whether asking if I pick an edge at random from the uniform distribution, what's the probability that the left end point is that the uh, is in yes and the right end point is in T? Now, if this were if I had picked the two vertices, if I had picked the 
two vertices completely at random, hmm? then this is exactly alpha and beta. I didn't pick them as endpoints of an edge, but I had picked the two vertices u and v at random. This would be alpha times beta. I want to say that picking an edge uniformly at random and picking it the two vertices independently is more or less uh, these two pro pro probabilities are more or less the same. If the gap, if the graph had a large spectral gap, in other words, lambda was small. This is at most lambda times square root alpha into one minus alpha. This is at most lambda times square root alpha into one minus alpha beta into one minus beta. Notice that this is a number. This quantity is a number less than one, and it is further shrunk. Smaller lambda is this says that this these two things look the same. The graph is so you pick, you're just picking a random edge, and it looks as if you're picking the two random edge. These two vertices, so the two vertices are extremely correlated vertices. They are endpoints of a. It's not a random graph. It's not a completely random graph. They are two endpoints of. Uh, once you pick a vertex, uh, once you pick the first vertex, the second vertex has only d choices. So there it seems as a very correlated thing, but yet this seems as if you are picking two completely independent random vertices. That's what this statement is saying. Is the statement of the expander mixing lemma? Okay. By the way, this quantity usually it's a weaker statement is what is said. They just say this is less than or equal to lambda square root alpha beta. They drop the one minus alpha, one minus beta because I discussed it. This is what is called the expander mixing lemma. EML is a very powerful tool to know if if you know the underlying random walk matrix has a spectral gap. It's something very powerful to know. Is the statement clear? And we just prove this. It will be an immediate consequence of the definition of spectral gap. Any questions on the statement of the EML? So I just want to run a sanity check. Can I do that? Okay. Sure. So okay. So let's say I just take S as a singleton and Y, sorry, T as a singleton. Yes. There, uh, there is no edge between them. Yeah. So can we just see what happens? What What does this say in that case? So this, uh, the, so there, the point is the, the of the, so the, you could have done even more. You could have taken S and T to be such that no. Uh, uh, T to be, we will in fact do this shortly. Right, right. Yes. T to be something which is not, which is exactly the vertices minus the neighborhood of S. Yes, yes. That. We will do this, we'll do this shortly, but let's uh, look at your particular example, S to be a singleton, T to be a singleton, and these uh, two vertices, S to be a uh, singleton set, Y to be a T, S and T to be singleton sets, which don't, don't correspond to the endpoints of an edge. Mm -hmm. Therefore, this quantity is certainly zero. Yes. This is one by n square. Yeah, exactly one by n square. Exactly one by n square. The point is, the, this will not give you any lambda. We will we'll see that this will tell you that lambda can't be too small for such graphs. Lambda will be at least all of you will get is lambda is greater than or equal to. Uh, so you here you will have lambda into roughly lambda into uh, la, la, lambda by n is what you will have. So lambda by n is greater than or equal to. 1 by n square, which is saying lambda is greater than 1 by n, it just says that uh, these things will, it will be the case that these graphs won't have such small, such large spectral gap. They won't have spectral gap like 1 minus 1 over n. The second, the spectral radius, leaving out the so trivial one, won't be as small as 1 over n. That's what it will tell you. Right. So if you have, if you had big S and T's, which are completely disjoint, kind of. Yeah. Then that says that the spectral gap cannot be. So we will. So once I write on this theorem, we'll actually see what are all these consequences after we prove the theorem. We'll see what happens. What does what does the what does lambda tell you on how good the expansion can be and all of that? We'll come to it shortly. But let's first prove this theorem. Mm -hmm. So the proof of it is actually we have set up all we did all this hard work just to set up the machinery for this. We are going to look at one S, which is the characteristic, the indicator vector for the set S. So one S of any vertex U is exactly one if U is in the S. So let's write it in this basis. So let's write one S as something A times 
all one plus something which is in the orthogonal space. Let's write it this basis. You can write expand it fully, but I'm just writing it as the all ones vector plus something. Let's find out firstly what this A is. So for one way of doing it is we, let's take the inner product on both sides with respect to one. So where one S is orthogonal to the all ones. This is right, that's writing it this way. So the next term when I take inner product is zero. That is, what do we get here? Here you'll get alpha times, this will be alpha equals A, therefore A is alpha. Hence, we have that one S is actually alpha times one plus something in the orthogonal component. Similarly, one T is beta times one plus one something in the orthogonal component. Now, what, what is the probability that you want to do? We want to try, if you pick an edge at random, edge UV at random, ask U is in S, V is in T, Notice the notation we set up, this is exactly one S M one T. Notice this is, if we recall the quadratic form, the quadratic form had this feature. F M G was exactly expected value of U V F U G V. Therefore, the FUGV, if F is the indicator function, this will uh, turn on only when U is in S and B is in T. And so that's exactly the probability that we care for. This is exactly the. So, writing this. So now we can expand this out. I'm going to write this as alpha times 1 plus 1s per m into beta times 1 plus. 1t perp by inner product. Let's open this out. So this is alpha beta 1 1, the inner product 1 1, plus alpha into the inner product between 1 and m 1t perp plus beta times the inner product between 1 s perp and m 1 plus 1 s per m times 1 t. I just opened things out. Now, what do we know? This, the first quantity, this is one. The inner product between one and one, the way we define. So this is just alpha beta. What about this? What is this? Actually, before that, let us see what is this? M of one is what? One, right? One. So what's the inner product between one as perp and one? So, uh, Pi S, uh, pi S complement. Huh? Would the pi S complement? Uh, one minus pi S. No, no. How did we define one? So let's go back. How did we define one S? One S is, we are writing it in the direction along the all ones vector and the perpendicular direction. Similarly, one T was written in the all ones direction and the perpendicular direction. So let's, Go back to this one. I'm going to write this again. Alpha one m one t perp plus. And what do we have here? Beta. Okay. Let me do. Let me do a say this one to write this object. I'm going to use the fact it is self adjoint and bring m to the other side. M one one t perp plus beta times one s perp one pi plus 1 s per m times 1 t per. Now, 
tell me what is this quantity? One minus d mod s. No, no. How did I define one s per per tall? So one s plus one s is one, right? Huh? One s per plus one s one s plus one s minus one s per is something that we can deal with. So, so we can use that. So one s per is the orthogonal part. One s per is the orthogonal part to one. That's how I have defined this. Oh, it's orthogonal to. Oh, I see. That's, so I've written one s as a part along one and orthogonal to one. So let's. I do not know if I lost people here. So take a vector one s. And I've written it along. So you take there's this vector one. This is vector one s. I've written it along the one direction, and so this is vector one s somehow over there. I've written it firstly along the one direction. This is a component along one, and this is the orthogonal component. I'm decomposing this that way. So this is one s. I've said that this is this. So it's the component along one. So it's some scaling of the all ones vector plus the orthogonal part. And then we asked, what is the what scaling is it? That scaling happened to be exactly the size of alpha, the size of the set A. Therefore, this is this was the key fact we want to get over here. Okay. Have I lost people completely over here, or what? You ask questions. Marty is saying your orthogonality was actually correct this time in the, yeah. in the picture, so he yes. limits that. Yeah. Yes. At this point, I don't want to put orthogonality that way. Blasphemous, even by my standards. But anyway, no, no. I'm a bit more concerned if people have lost me. So. Whatever it may be, maybe I mean I mean I don't know if it helps to sort of think of the I mean we know that the set of eigenvalues form a basis, which is this v one, which is basically another name for the all ones vector v two, v three, all the way till the n. And all we are doing is writing one s as some linear combination of these. Whatever was the component of v one, that is only this a times one. Everything else is something that we are plumbing into one s this per. one s per, and the only observation that we are making here is that whatever you had in the one s per is completely orthogonal to one according to the inner product we have. Um, I mean, by definition, because the vectors are orthogonal. Therefore, these this quantity is all I'm saying is this quantity is zero, and similarly, this quantity is also zero. The way one s per and one t per were defined, these two quantities are zero. So this is this expression out here just happens to be equal to alpha beta plus one s per m times one t per. Can you show the step where a is equal to alpha? You write it. Uh... Yeah. So let's. So we wrote one s as I wrote one s as a some scaling of a some scaling of the all one vector plus the orthogonal part. Now I want to find out what is this scaling. So I took the inner product with one on both sides. So this is. So I took the inner product with one here. And here I'm taking the inner product with one, and I'm using the fact that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So this further implies this one is exactly alpha. And this side, this side is ex, this is exactly alpha. This is exactly alpha, and this is. A. This is a times one, and a is equal to alpha. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yes. Yeah. So, what is all of this done? So, notice this. What we really cared about was this quantity. We wanted to care about cared about this probability minus alpha beta. And what have we seen? That probability exactly be happens to be alpha beta plus some term. So the, what the, so the thing which we, 
quantity we this is exactly the quantity we cared for that is you pick an edge uv at random u is in s v is in t minus alpha beta so this happened to be exactly the absolute value of 1s per m times 1t per this is equality and we want to put a bound on this all of this was just to do observe this fact um uh, i have a question so uh, sure. in uh, in the equation which you showed like alpha equal to a yeah uh, uh so your uh, left hand side is the probability of choosing from the set s under the measure pi right yes yeah so why is that alpha it uh, okay. alpha so, is the measure okay. when it okay. okay so what i should have written here is not so so pi of s is alpha and pi of t is beta ah okay okay and uh, for the d regular graph this is the in the case of d regular graph the the size of the set is the measure in the okay. wrong okay. yeah you are right you are right thanks for pointing that out what i meant was the measure of s in the set is alpha and the measure of the set t under the pi distribution is beta okay but now okay this is where what abhishek said i use i need quasi schwartz for the inner product so this is at most the norm of 1s per times the norm of m times 1t Fine. Now, this is the first one. I'll retain it as is. The so second like, one, like both of them are two norms like with respect to pi. Both of them are two norms with respect to pi. This is a pi in a product. Therefore, all for this one. So this is exactly lambda times one. This is the definition of the spectral gap. Now let's look at what is one s per. So it's two norm. So what did we have? Let's look at. So I I want to know. I want to ask this question. What is one s per two norm? So what do we know? We know one is equal to one s is equal to alpha times one plus one s per. The Pythagoras theorem will tell you that. One s per two norm square is alpha one two norm square plus one s per two norm square. That's Pythagoras theorem. What is the what is this quantity? Let's look at each one of them. This is one s one s. This is alpha square one one. And this is the quantity. Mm -hmm. Mr. Perp. Sorry, I missed a point. What is this? One s, one s. Probability of picking from from the pi. Yes, it's probability alpha. picking. This is just pi s, which is alpha. This is alpha square plus one s per. Where therefore the one s perp is exactly one s perp two is exactly equal to alpha into one minus alpha the square root of this. It's alpha minus alpha square. Yeah. So the error term, the 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 absolute value of the difference, we saw that it was less than or equal to lambda times one s perp two pi times one t perp. Two pi. This is equal to square root of alpha one minus alpha beta one minus beta. And that's what all the okay. Let's go over the proof a little once more. What is what is EML stating? EML is stating if you pick an edge at random, 
what's the problem and you have two sets s and t whose densities are alpha and beta if you pick an edge at random what's the probability that the left end point is in s and the right end point is t if this if you had picked these two vertices completely independently at random without picking it from an edge this is exactly alpha beta i want to know what's the difference between these two quantities that says that this difference is controlled by the spectral gap the larger the spectral gap the smaller is this hmm? and how are we going to do we are going to use resort to all the linear algebra we do we look we come up with why do we work with one as the indicator function one as and one t because this probability that we care for is exactly this quantity one as m times one t it was this probability that we cared for because of this we care about the indicator functions one as and one t now we write them down in the eigen base so we write it as one as as a times one plus one as perp and we saw that that a has to be actually alpha so we have that one as is alpha one plus one as perp similarly one t is beta one plus some orthogonal component all i all the observing is the comp if one s the component along one is exactly the density the scaling of the component along one is the is the density of the size, size set yes and then is the orthogonal form and then you just plug it in you realize that this inner product happens to be exactly alpha beta plus this extra error term and now you do, it's just a sequence of using cauchy schwartz It's it's one Cauchy Schwartz. That's all that's happening, and the definition of spectral gap. So this is Cauchy Schwartz from here to here. This is the definition of spectral gap, and then you actually find out what is one s perp and one t perp. Their length by Pythagoras theorem is exactly square root alpha into one minus alpha and square root beta into one minus beta. And this is it's an immediate consequence of the definition of uh, the spectral gap. The expander mixing lemma. Any questions on this, on the statement or the proof? Okay, that's fine. But we then go ahead. Actually, the expander mixing lemma has a sort of a. So this says if there's a spectral gap, then You have such a, you have such a, uh, then then these two quantities are very close to each other. Then these two quantities are, the uh, the error term is only so much. There happens to be a converse to the expander mixing lemma. If you can show that these two quantities are close to each other, then say close with respect to instead of lambda, you have some theta. Then you can show that the spectral gap is somehow related to theta. You can that is the expander mixing lemma has a partial converse. To it. we will not need this but there is actually exists a partial converse that is there is a partial converse that is eml conclusion implies a spectral gap okay yeah but why did we do all of this all of this was done to show that spectral expansion implies vertex expansion so how do we show that we want to take a set yes and we want to find out how large is its neighborhood n of s we call this was our that was the vertex expansion we want to find out s in terms of nfs so let's i'm going to apply this statement so let's s be this one let t be the vertex minus nfs so let's just before once again so say s is such that pi of s is alpha and look at let's look at the neighborhood of s and let's say Pi of neighborhood of S. I want to show that this is also large. Let that be beta. Let that be beta. I need to show beta is large in terms of this one. But we're going to up, use the expanded mixing lemma and apply to B minus N of S. This is sort of the thing which Abhishek was looking at. So notice now I'll ap apply EML. Apply EML to sets 
एस एंड टी सो एम गोइंग टू राइट दिस प्रोबेबिलिटी आई पिक अ यू बी रैंडम फ्रॉम हेड यू इज इन एस पी इज इन टी माइनस अल्फा टाइम्स हियर इट्स वन माइनस बीटा इट्स लेस देन और इक्वल टू लैम्डा इनटू स्क्वायर रूट अल्फा माइनस वन माइनस अल्फा बीटा इनटू वन माइनस बीटा beta is 1 minus beta but to the right hand side uh, beta into 1 minus beta is the same as 1 minus beta into beta okay now what is this quantity yeah so that's zero right that is zero the way we defined it because we t is exactly those points which don't have uh, an edge uh, and point to it so this probability is zero so at the end of this we have that this implies That alpha into one minus beta is less than or equal to lambda times square root alpha into one minus alpha beta one minus beta, which implies alpha into one minus beta is less than or equal to lambda square beta into one minus alpha. Hmm? So I want to say this implies beta. is greater than or equal to alpha by lambda square 1 minus alpha plus alpha and this is sort of the statement we want beta has to be large if alpha so and let's do let's stare at the statement a little closely so this the, that is pi of s is equal to alpha then i'm claiming that pi of n of s is greater than or equal to alpha by lambda square 1 minus alpha plus alpha this is what we shown and let's look at the denominator over here is the denominator a quantity less than 1 or larger than 1 larger is less than 1 1 why is it less than 1 lambda because 1 minus alpha is positive yeah so 1 minus alpha and alpha if you sum them up they are 1 but lambda square if the gap a spectral gap lambda square is strictly away is not 1 it's a number smaller than 1 therefore now it's a your 1 minus alpha plus alpha is not something so this number is smaller than 1 so in particular it says that this ratio is something strictly larger than alpha so any set of size alpha is at least alpha times this extra factor and this is exactly what vertex expect and this factor is a 1 plus something if lambda square is not if lambda square is not 1 if the when is lambda square 1 when there is no spectral gap so it says whenever lambda square is not 1 this quantity is a number always greater than this ratio is a number greater than 1 because the denominator is a number less than 1 it says in all those cases the neighborhood of s is larger than alpha by this factor which is a factor larger than 1 so in particular what have we shown here let's conclude the theorem that we have is if g equals be is some n vertex graph with spectral gap gamma equals 1 minus lambda then for all sets yes of size at most and let me make it a t regular graph this so statement is what we have proved is more general but let's make it t regular of size at most uh, rho m n of s is at least size of s by so let's say lambda square 
1 minus rho plus rho that is g is a rho n 1 by lambda square 1 minus rho plus rho vertex x. want to stare at this a little more. So I want to write this quantity, this quantity over here, just let me do one more step. This quantity over here is also alpha times, the denominator can be written as alpha into one minus lambda square plus lambda square. So the, these both are the same thing. Uh, the, 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 the denominator is symmetric and we have three more minutes and five minutes. Okay. The denominator is symmetric and alpha and lambda square. Actually, it doesn't look like that, but it's actually symmetric in these two expressions. And notice that the expansion factor is, the expansion factor, we wanted it to be a factor, we wanted to say a graph is a Ka expander. It expands by a factor at least A. Huh? Now here, I'm not getting a factor A, I'm getting a factor which is dependent on the size of the original set. Because this factor is, this is the factor which we are getting over here. But notice this factor becomes better and better as alpha becomes smaller and smaller. Do you have a charger? I do have a charger. No, actually, I might have a charger that will last. I don't think it's going to last. So yeah, here is there any restriction on rho? So no, no, no. So let's so why why? So this is what I'm saying. So that's should have taken off this theorem and moved it. Okay. So let's, yeah, so let's uh, state this. So first, uh, whatever I'm doing over here. So this, I want to write this as, I want to write this fact as alpha into one by alpha into one minus lambda square plus lambda square. This is, I've done nothing over here. Okay. Now, what is this? Well, what's what's this observation stating? Sets of size alpha of size alpha n expand by one by alpha into one minus lambda square plus lambda square factor. That's all you have. To do. If you have a set of a particular size, it expands by this factor. This is what we have proven so far. Now, notice that this factor, which we have over here, becomes better and better as alpha becomes smaller and smaller. It's worst for the largest alpha. So if you are talking about, say, if you only care about sets of size up to rho n, the worst expansion factor is got when alpha is equal to a particular is the largest row. That's why I have said that for all things up to row, they expand by this factor. Set smaller actually expand by even a better factor than this. That's all this is there. Because this number is a number which is uh, sort of decreasing with alpha. As alpha increases, it decreases. Smaller sets expand even larger. Is that okay? The smallest, the best expansion can have is when alpha is really, really close to zero in which the expansion is as large as one over lambda square. Does this answer your question, Ishan? Yeah, but I mean, we can go, we can go close to, uh, I mean, this, uh, if there is spectral expansion, we even for rho close to one, there will still be some uh, expansion, right? I mean. Yeah, yeah. This guarantees that every set, every set, actually expands, even rho close to one expands. And it expands by a factor larger than one, yes. You won't be able to get it when rho equals one. At that point, you don't get any expansion. When alpha equals one, the factor becomes one. If alpha is not, if rho is any quantity less than one, then you have an expansion by a factor larger than one. 
So, so you need to cap off. So if you want expansion, a particular amount, you say, I will, uh, what is the largest size set that you can expand or go up to? If you want expand, so if you want a particular expansion, the expansion decreases as the size of the set keeps increasing and it becomes, and there's no expansion when you row hits one, which is what you would expect. Obviously when row hits one, you can't expand. The neighborhood is the graph, the same set of vertices. And this is what it says, the expansion. This, this quantity over here becomes one when alpha becomes one. But it is something which is larger than one for every other or every smaller alpha. So if you, so you cap, you so you will say, I cap it off at, I only look at the sets of size up to row n, then you know that all sets up to row n expand by this quantity when alpha is put to row. Smaller sets possibly expand by a larger factor, but all sets expand by this factor and that factor is a factor which is larger than one. So what we are saying is, in fact, we have the following theorem. It is, the, we have then for all row in, in zero comma one or everything in this interval, we have such an interval. So if you give me spectral expansion, you get vertex expansion for every possible k, every k less than n, not just a particular k, you get it for every k less than n. And, but the expansion deteriorates up to the point k which you want. If you want it for larger size sets, the expansion deteriorates. If you just want it for very small sets, you get very good expansion. Is that clear? Any questions on this? I'll take a couple of questions and then we'll break. And, but by the way, beginning of next lecture, we'll stare at this theorem again and see what it means. What does, how small lambda can be and all of this, we'll stare at the next theorem. But I want to, this theorem is just basically stating that if I prove that the graph has spectral expansion, then that proves that the graph has vertex expansion, which is what, I, what we wanted to do. That is spectral expansion, this sort of capture implies vertex. It's an analytic way in which you can guarantee expansion, vertex expansion. Questions? Uh, hi. Uh, <clears throat> Neha? Oh, okay, yeah, so let me ask. So uh, I was wondering, is there any intuitive way to uh, expect why a uh, second eigenvalue should be uh, so related to expansion? Uh, in this random walk over the graph. Yeah, so what it so happens is so what, yeah, okay, okay. Here we just did this, we jumped to directly this second eigenvalue. Why does it have this one? So let's look at, let's look at this picture over here. This picture over here. Now let's look at what are graphs that are not expanding. Certainly, if a graph is decomposed into multiple components, that's certainly a graph that doesn't expand. Because if you suppose a graph has two disconnected components, then this is a graph that does not expand at all. Because you take the smaller component, its neighborhood can never be larger than the size of its set. Okay. So let's look at things that are not. So that's an expand ex size of a set. So that's an example of a graph which does not expand. Now, what's another example of a graph that does not expand? A bipartite graph. A bipartite graph, if you have a bipartite graph, uh, then if you take the smaller side, uh, smaller uh, side, uh, you take the smaller, rather the larger side, and you look at its neighborhood, obviously the neighborhood is, small, is no larger than the uh, side you came from. So a bipartite graph is another expansion of a non-expanding graph. So certainly, these graphs, bipartite graphs, disjoint graphs cannot be expanding at all. Now, if you stare, we, we don't have time to spend on this for a graph that has disconnected components. Notice that what we have shown that there's all, irrespective of whichever graph we take, there's the largest eigenvector is sitting at one. What you can show is, you can ask, there might be other eigenvalues also which sit at one. What you can show is the number of eigenvalues that sit at one is exactly the number of components of the graph. If the graph had only one component, there would be exactly one eigenvalue here and all the rest will be away. If the graph has 10 components, 10 disjoint components, there'll be 10 eigenvalues, uh, 10 eigenvalues of which have magnitude one. 
Oh, so uh, is it because like each component is like a Markov chain in itself? I mean, this uh, this it's a right. graph each, is like states of a Markov you, you, chain. In the each each mark each graph is a Markov chain in itself. Therefore, there is a distribution which is just just take the stationary distribution on that graph and zero elsewhere. That is a uh -huh. yeah, yeah. that is a walk. Therefore, these are all these are all eigen. In fact, these are orthogonal eigenvectors. They are all on all on disjoint supports. Right. Yeah. So, if a graph is disjoint, uh, if a graph is disjoint, lambda two will become will collapse to one. Mm -hmm. And you can show the same thing if a graph is bipartite, lambda n goes to minus one. Oh. Uh. That's you take a little bit of work, but you can uh, write it down and show that lambda n will be equal to minus one if a graph is bipartite. Therefore, you must escape these two cases. You must certainly lambda n cannot be minus one, lambda two cannot be one if the graph has to be expanding. And okay. Okay. and what the whole theorem is stating that once you just sort of move away from those those both, there is some form of expansion, and the further you keep moving away, there is more and more expansion. Uh -huh. That's what this whole thing is trying to say. You take off the two bottlenecks, which is the disjoint graphs and the bipartite graphs. You take off these two cases in which the case in which lambda two goes all the way to one or lambda n goes all the way to minus one. You take off these two extremes, then there is a gap always. And now you want to say whenever there is a gap, there is some expansion. And the larger the gap, there is more and more expansion. And that is substantiated by whatever we said so far. Okay, so uh, I mean, is there a difference for these sort of things? Basically, it's like a relate looking at a Markov chain from this linear so algebra. What we will do, what we will do next lecture, we will talk about the random walk, and we'll find out how the second eigenvalue will also tell how good the random walk mixes. That's mm -hmm. what we'll be doing in the next lecture. So that will there. But all of what I said today and the next lecture, so there are multiple places. There's Jan Spielman's notes on spectral graph theory where he covers this. You can also just look at the four lect four lectures I taught in the toolkit course, which will go. It spends a lot of time on what lambda two and lambda n mean in this one. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So the reason is okay. If I had more time, I would have done this. Is the two bottleneck things are the disjoint graphs, the bipartite graphs, and those are the cases when there is no gap. The disjoint graphs in which there is no gap between lambda two and one. The bipartite case is when there is no gap between minus one and lambda n, and you we are going to avoid those two cases. We are going to say there is a gap in either case because there is this one. And and what is this? This is just a robust version of that statement. It says that more the gap, more are you going to expand. If of course there is no gap, if one of the two were if the gap here was zero, the gap there was zero, you can show that the graph doesn't expand at all. And this is a more robust version of that statement. Whatever we have. RP, were you saying something on this? I mean, I was saying basically the what happens in a random walk, but I guess you will be covering that. The random walk, I will do it in detail uh, okay. next lecture. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that to me is one place where you really see, I mean, if you want the walk to mix, to become more and more uniform, it feels like the right parameter to look at is lambda. Like the whatever, the spectral gap. And it will show very naturally. Yeah, yeah. And we'll see that in the next lecture. We'll see that in the next lecture. Okay. By the way, the EML, I just wanted to say the EML is a very powerful statement. I wanted to write one more, taken already times. The EML was a statement. Sometimes the EML is written in the following fashion on EM, an alternate. Uh, viewpoint of the EML. And this way is actually easier to remember for me. So let f and g be two functions on the set of vertices. And what I'm looking at is the expected value. If you pick an edge at random, you're looking at fu times gv minus mu of f. This is the expected value of f, expected value of g. This is at most lambda times square root, lambda times. The standard deviation of f, standard deviation of g, where all, where means, standard deviation, everything is is computed with respect to the distribution. Pi, that is, mu of f is expected value of 
f of u, u being coming from pi, and sigma f square is the variance which is expected value of f square u, u coming from pi minus expected value of f u, u coming from pi whole square. So I find this form of the EML very convenient to use. It's actually, I have found it. And the what, what we proved exactly is proves exactly the statement. Questions, we will stop. So, this is a partial converges, partial only because of the regularity assumed in the graph. What's the you're asking about the partial converse to EML? So yeah, the, the partial let me state the partial converse. So, if we have the following statement if we have that the probability minus alpha beta is less than or equal to say some theta times square root alpha beta, then you can show that lambda is less than or equal to some constant times theta 1 plus log t by t. So uh, here there's no d. I mean, huh? I mean, this is, I mean, the d is only if you're looking at the non-normalized version. Right? Or there is a d, is it? I think there is a d even then. Oh, okay. This so maybe suffers, I, I missed suffers, it. This is uh, Abhishek's this one. That is, I think it suffers from Am I sure about that? I'm not. Uh, I'm not fully sure about this. I'm not fully sure about that. I'll have this is this is this, this is due to below and linear, and it's partial because the it's not partial because of the d. I think it's partial because of this log theta. On one direction, if you get a theta bound over here, you get only a theta into log one over theta over here. I, I must be care this one about this. That's just I'm not sure about this. What this is. I think it is just one by this thing. At least that's according to Wiki. According I mean, Wiki to has it, Wiki refers lambda as the lambda for the adjacency matrix, not the normalized adjacency matrix. Okay. okay. And there it is uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's partial because of this extra log factor, not because of the yeah. So it is known for non-regular graphs also. Uh, no, I don't know. The Billu lineal proof as stated is for regular graphs. Regular. Almost everywhere, everything is stated only for regular graphs. So either the non-regular case is just the same proof works or somebody needs to do this. Like the, what we did today worked for both regular and non-regular, the setup. But almost everywhere it's written, things are only written for the regular case. Because regular case is cleaner. But there's I don't know, but I have not seen Billu linear proof, so I do not know if it works this one. What we will see, what the reason I did it for the non, not necessary regular cases, everything work, everything the way once we set up this notation, that's why we spent the first half an hour, is things work in the non-regular case. It works for any random walk matrix. And that sometimes it's good to know that. Yeah, I care about the non-regular case. Non-regular case. Yes, this is a partial converse. To Billu and Linear. Billu and Linear is actually quite an amazing paper to read, not just for this theorem, but there are lots of, it has a collection of results related to spectral graph theory, and all of them are extremely beautiful results. Okay, let's stop with this. I've already exceeded by 15 minutes. And let's meet on Tuesday. <laughs>